So Adam Smith is popularly known as the father of economics or the father of laissez-faire capitalism. And I bet if you don't immediately recall his name or what he's famous for, if there's one thing you probably do know or remember, maybe from your college econ classes, is that he wrote The Wealth of Nations and gave us the idea of the invisible hand. This idea that individuals pursuing their self-interest can promote the public good without intention or direction. And that idea of the invisible hand has become a symbol of winner-take-all capitalism in America, and Smith is often portrayed as a dogmatic supporter of free markets. But that picture, this popular picture, fundamentally misunderstands Smith as an Enlightenment thinker from the 18th century. So some of you may be surprised to learn, for example, that Smith's first work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, was published in 1759. That's before The Wealth of Nations was published in 1776. And it was the work that he continued to revise after he published The Wealth of Nations, right up to his death in 1790. And when you read The Theory of Moral Sentiments alongside The Wealth of Nations, you realize that Smith devoted a lifetime of work to so much more than just understanding the economic behavior of man. He was also interested in moral and political behavior. So suddenly you get a bigger, richer picture of what Smith and his ideas stand for. He's just as much a critic as he is a champion of the system that he's often credited with creating. And rather than being a defender of growth at all costs, he actually was deeply worried about the social and moral consequences of widening inequality. So my work as a political theorist and as a historian of ideas investigates this question of how and why we adopted this view of Adam Smith as an economist of amoral capitalism in America, and why we forget Adam Smith, the moral philosopher. And what I've discovered is that since the 18th century, some of America's most famous statesmen and influential thinkers constantly turned to the wealth of nations as one of their most important guidebooks and resources to shape political thinking. So for example, in the 18th century, Alexander Hamilton, our nation's first treasury secretary, and as we now know, our only rap star founding father, <laughs> used the wealth of nations to craft his plans for the first national bank, and also to convince other American statesmen that the way to progress was through trade and commerce, not through agriculture. In the 19th century, I've read reports from the congressional records that legislators were frequently reciting passages from the Wealth of Nations and invoking Smith's name on the Congress floor to make arguments for why we should open or close our borders to more trade. Sound familiar? And in the 20th century, the economist Milton Friedman very famously transformed the idea of the invisible hand into one of the most important and iconic metaphors in American conservative political and economic ideology. So what this all amounts to is that over 200 years, people have been reading and engaging with the wealth of nations as a political tool. But the theory of moral sentiments and Adam Smith's moral philosophy has really fallen to the wayside. And that's the Adam Smith that I want to reintroduce to you today. The Adam Smith who wrote the theory of moral sentiments, or at least the Adam Smith that we don't often get the chance to read in our college econ classes. And I want to show you how reading Smith's moral philosophy can open up new and important ways for thinking about what President Obama once called the defining challenge of our time, that is, economic inequality. Now, you might expect Adam Smith to make an argument about economic inequality the way that some of our most famous economists and social scientists today talk about inequality, that economic inequality is bad for growth, or that gains at the top don't necessarily trickle down to the bottom. But what's striking about the way Smith talks about inequality is that he focuses on the social and moral consequences. So what's wrong with inequality, according to Adam Smith, is not just that some people have a lot more than others, but that vast inequalities in material goods could translate into and exacerbate inequalities in the way in which we treat people with dignity and respect. So he writes in the theory of moral sentiments that the rich man glories in his riches because he feels they naturally draw upon him the attention of the world. On the other end, the poor man is ashamed of his poverty, he feels out of the sight of mankind, or that if anybody notices him, they have scarce any fellow feeling with the misery and distress which he suffers. 
So Smith's insight is the following, that people want to be wealthy not just because being wealthy allows you to buy more stuff, but because wealth is power. Wealth attracts people's attention. It enables you to be seen as more, being more deserving of respect. While people want to avoid poverty, not just because it's a condition of material deprivation, but it's because it's a condition of being deprived, being recognized as worthy of respect from others. And he says that this disposition to admire and almost to worship the rich and powerful, to despise or at least to neglect persons of poor and mean condition, is the great and most universal cause of the corruption of our moral sentiments. And if left unchecked, Smith worried that there was a dangerous tendency to see the vices and follies of the wealthy and powerful as fashionable, to let the rich and powerful get away with immoral or illicit behavior. Now, what I find so striking about this line of Smith's ideas is not just how much they speak to our present circumstances, but that they're not always forgotten. In fact, John Adams, when he was our Vice President of the United States, drew from these ideas from the theory of moral sentiments in crafting a series of essays, a series of lesser known essays, called the Discourses on Davila, which he started writing in 1791. So he echoes Smith, asking, why should a rich man glory in his riches? And then answers, because riches attract the attention, consideration, and congratulations of mankind. But the poor man would be ashamed, neglected, despised, and mankind would take no notice of him. But beyond just echoing what Smith wrote as ideas to think about, Adams characterized this inequality of sympathy as one of the greatest threats to the democratic fabric of American society. If we let wealth wield influence, not just in terms of political power, but in terms of moral and social power, how could we still consider ourselves a democracy that, can, that treated every citizen with equal respect and dignity? So the reason why I wanted to focus on this line of Smith's thoughts the way that John Adams did over 200 years ago is to offer a new and powerful paradigm for the way in which we think and talk about inequality today. What we need to think about is making sure that material conditions aren't inhibited of treating everybody with equal respect and dignity. Nobody should be ashamed of appearing in society be merely on account of what they lack. And we need to reorient the way we think about wealth as a pure signal of success and merit. Because what's at stake aren't just material conditions like growth, but the very moral values that underpin a healthy democracy. Thank you.